Good afternoon and welcome to the Angry Astronaut. So finally getting past all of the bulletins for the week, all of the short-term news stories, and want to talk a little bit about our long-term ambitions, especially on the moon. Now, after all of the decisions came out regarding Blue Origin, Dynetics being cast aside, all of that, I was, as I'm sure a lot of you have noticed, very frustrated over all of that and really had a hard time figuring out why NASA had made the decision that they did. That is to say, embark on another ambitious lunar lander enterprise that was going to involve an extensive infrastructure, an extensive refueling infrastructure, especially utilizing vehicles that have, haven't even begun to be built yet and are actually in the early stages of being designed. How do we really think that we're going to set down on the moon in anything resembling a reasonable timetable if we're going to use that kind of solution? Don't we already have a solution like that with Starship? Well, the fact of the matter is, after I had an opportunity to reread NASA's plan for building the cislunar economy, things became a little more clear to me. The fact of the matter is, NASA needs Starship or something similar to Starship if they really want to build the kind of economy that they are trying to build with Artemis, at least the beginnings of this kind of economy. And as you saw from the thumbnail, we're talking a $3.7 trillion economy. That, of course, is huge and you're not going to accomplish those sorts of huge objectives with little landers like the alpaca. And so that's why you need things like Starship and why you need vehicles like Blue Moon as well. And this is not something that NASA just came up with recently. This has actually been part of their overall plan to build the cislunar economy through Artemis years ago, even before Starship was really a thing. The fact of the matter is, though, the emergence of Starship and also some of the new vehicles that Blue Origin is planning has allowed NASA to become more ambitious with their plans, and it makes this long-term goal more feasible. And it's not just Blue Origin and SpaceX that can contribute to this. Also, ULA fits into the plan, and so too do the Europeans and the Japanese. And I'm going to explain how all of this is possible in just a moment. So let's have a look at this plan in detail. And by the way, if you like this content, please like and please subscribe to this channel. And also don't forget those notification bells. Okay, this is a lunar city as envisioned by a company called iSpace that they think might exist in 2040. I kind of doubt it, but here's how you enable such a thing. In the 2020s, deploy probes and rovers to the lunar surface, which is something now NASA has been planning to do for some time now, namely with companies like Astrobotic and their Viper and Peregrine landers, with the objective of finding lunar resources. And the most important resource, of course, is lunar ice. Once you have lunar ice, you have the capability of building a fuel station on the surface of the moon, a fuel station that can then supply fuel depots in lunar orbit or even fuel depots in Earth orbit far more easily than we can send propellant from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit. Six times as easy as a matter of fact. So once you have that depot in place, the ability for spacecraft to go to the moon, mine for resources, and then return to Earth becomes much, much more feasible. So any landers that you send to the surface of the moon 
Moon have an objective of not only finding these resources, but also of exploiting them to begin the initial process of building this fuel station and then making it possible for this fuel station to supply orbital fuel depots and get this entire process going. In order to accomplish that, you need sizable lunar landers. In other words, Starship or Blue Moon. And as I said before, NASA has actually been intending to pursue this sort of objective, utilizing what they call Commercial Orbital Transfer Services, or COTS spacecraft, even before Starship existed. And this is laid out in a plan called Kickstarting a New Era of Lunar Industrialization via Campaigns of Lunar COTS Missions. And by the way, this was put out by researchers from the NASA Ames Research Center and NASA Kennedy Space Center. And I'm going to share some excerpts of this plan with you, and it is, of course, linked in the description as well. Quote, Ever since Apollo, there have not been any human missions beyond low Earth orbit because none of the proposed program plans were economical or proclaimed a top national priority. The proposed plan outlines a three-phase approach with new campaigns of low-cost, commercial-enabled lunar commercial orbital transfer services, or COTS, and the objectives of these new campaigns of missions are to prospect for resources, determine the economic viability of extracting those resources, and assess the value proposition of using these resources in future exploration architectures such as Mars. These missions would be accomplished in partnership with commercial industry using the well-proven COTS program acquisition model. So in other words, these lunar landers are part of the overall COTS program with the long-term objective of building a thriving lunar industry and a lunar economy. And here's the specific goals. Number one, to develop and demonstrate cost-effective cis-lunar commercial services such as lunar transportation, lunar mining, and lunar in-situ resource utilization operations. Number two, to enable development of an affordable and economical exploration architecture for future missions to Mars and beyond. And number three, to incentivize the creation of a new lunar market through use of lunar resources for the economic benefit to NASA, commercial industry, and the international community. And so here's the specifics of the three-phase approach. Phase one, surface resources and hazards assessment. First of all, you need to demonstrate capabilities to transport payloads from Earth to lunar surface cost-effectively, which of course both Blue Moon and Starship are intended to do. Secondly, to prospect several sites for surface resources and hazards, provide ground truth data of various sites, assess potential sites for hazards and accessibility, and finally, to demonstrate techniques for resource extraction and future ISRU operations. Then you move on to Phase 2, Pilot Lunar ISRU Demonstration, which is to demonstrate capabilities for ISRU, by the way, that stands for in-situ resource utilization production, such as water, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and storage on a pilot scale program. Then to demonstrate feasibility and economics of scaling up production and capability to store several tons of resources on the lunar surface. And by the way, since the advent of Starship and Blue Moon, that now has risen to 10, 20, maybe even 30 tons of resources. Then to demonstrate capability to transport large payloads from lunar surface to cis-lunar space destinations for long-term storage. And by the way, also the capability of storing resources on the lunar surface, especially hydrogen and oxygen, those are the sorts of things that Blue Origin has been particularly focused on because their engines run off of hydrogen and oxygen, unlike Starship and the Alpaca, which run off of methyl ox. And then finally, we come to Phase 3, Lunar ISRU Production and Delivery Services. NASA awards long-term contracts for lunar ISRU production of water or liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen on the order of several metric tons per year. And I think that that figure is going to increase significantly too, now that we have landers capable of carrying 20, 30, or even 100 tons to lunar orbit. On top of that, awards are also made 
for delivery services to the CIS Lunar Depot, so there's going to be a fuel depot in lunar orbit, and then awards are made to multiple commercial providers to reduce risk and enable competition. So once you have this CIS Lunar Depot that's being provided with propellant and oxidizer from the lunar surface, that should open the floodgates. It will make it far more feasible for commercial endeavors to make their way to the moon, refueling in the process, and then exploit the resources on the moon. And those resources, by the way, are endless. We're talking lots of rare metals and rare earths, which are worth thousands of dollars per kilogram. And in addition to that, lots of resources that are useful in space. We're not just talking about propellant, we're talking about oxygen for lunar facilities. The moon has enough oxygen bound into its regolith to support every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth for a hundred thousand years. Let me say that again. There's enough oxygen bound up in the lunar regolith to support the entire human population for a hundred thousand years if you can just mine that oxygen. That could be just as valuable as gold or platinum or anything else else you might be able to find on the moon. And as time goes on and incentives increase for us to mine off-planet where it's less destructive to the environment, that's going to make this industry much, much more valuable. $3.7 trillion may be a conservative estimate. And by the way, before the advent of Starship and Blue Moon, NASA had laid out a number of other alternative COTS providers that could accomplish some pretty amazing things without the existence of these big reusable ships, most significant of which is the Vulcan Aces or the Centaur 5 upper stage. Now, the Aces program has been discontinued, but Centaur 5 essentially intends to continue all of the things that Aces was supposed to do. Specifically, ACES is supposed to be able to deliver 30 tons worth of payload to Earth orbit, or more specifically around 25 or 26 tons, but what's important is its ability to be refueled. Does that sound familiar? ULA had the idea of refueling the upper stage of Vulcan Centaur way before Starship ever existed. It was just the political allies of SLS that that put this entire project on hold. And by the way, this is a vehicle called the Zeus, which is little more than a Centaur 5 upper stage modified to land on the moon to deliver lots of cargo and to take that cargo off the lunar surface as well. And it's refuelable, just like all of the other solutions NASA is looking at, and it's reusable. So if you have a fuel depot or fuel station on the moon that this ship can make use of, and keep in mind, it runs off of RL-10 engines, which also use hydrogen and oxygen, then you have an alternate lunar COTS or lunar tanker, lunar freighter, whatever you want to call it, that can also be used to help build up the lunar economy. This is something that NASA has been intending to use for quite some time, and even though ULA has not received an official contract, I anticipate that this sort of ship is going to be in service well before Blue Origin can get any of their solutions into service, which means that if Starship can help establish that initial fuel station on the surface of the moon, ULA might actually be able to beat out Blue Origin as a key part of the lunar infrastructure. What a strange irony that would be if SpaceX and ULA were to collaborate in order to cut Blue Origin out of the lunar economy. I don't think Elon Musk would turn down an opportunity opportunity like that. And also, ironically, ULA is going to get the funding to accomplish something like this through the billions of dollars that they're getting paid to deploy the Kuiper constellation. That would be ironic indeed. But of course, Blue Origin isn't just going to sit back and allow this to happen. Instead, they're going to compete to become the key part of the lunar infrastructure, the most important part, and this kind of competition is also going to help drop 
drive the lunar economy to that $3.7 trillion mark, which once again, I think is very achievable. And the Americans are not the only ones who have a stake in this game. The Europeans are also looking to become part of this cis-lunar infrastructure. And one of the most important vehicles that are part of this process is the Airbus Moon Cruiser. Now, the Moon Cruiser is not designed to carry an enormous amount of payload the way all of these other solutions do, but at the same time, there are many missions involved with Artemis that simply are not going to require 20, 30, 100 tons worth of cargo. For example, the Lunar Gateway is going to require constant resupply, and the Moon Cruiser can deliver as much as four and a half metric tons to the Gateway. That would be enough to sustain that small space station for a very long period of time. Indeed, four and a half tons worth of supplies can do a lot for a variety of different lunar missions. But in addition to that, the Moon Cruiser is also designed to deploy something called the European Large Logistics Lander. Now, if you have a lunar installation or a lunar mining facility or a research facility that has to be a little ways away from your landing site, because keep in mind, Starship is only going to be able to land in so many different places in the difficult terrain of the lunar south pole. Therefore, it's going to be a substantial distance probably between Starship's landing site and mining locations, research locations, etc. So instead of having to transport your supplies and other necessities to and from Starship and these locations, you can deliver the supplies directly to these sites with the smaller European large logistics lander. So the lander could deliver a combination of cargo to the astronauts on the surface and also carry a variety of different scientific packages, including rovers that sniff out new resources in different locations. And this also includes an ascent module that will allow it to collect samples from these locations and then carry it up back to the Lunar Gateway for further analysis. That's a very important capability that will allow this un manned lander to service a variety of different locations on the lunar surface and then return the supplies back to the lunar gateway. It's not something that's going to be delivering enormous amounts of payload, but will, will allow a lot of flexibility. A small lander like this will be able to search for new resources in difficult to reach locations and also resupply astronauts in locations that might be difficult to service with big landers like Starship or Blue Moon. In other words, deliver the capabilities that Alpaca was supposed to deliver, except with just supplies and nothing else. I would have preferred to see Alpaca also be involved in this process. I think it's important to have greater flexibility in where you can land on the moon, but as long as ESA can deliver this capability, then bigger is better as far as what NASA's doing. This is all an integrated approach. It's very interesting to see how all of this is going to develop, and now I understand a bit more as to why NASA made the decisions that they did, although I still don't think that Blue Origin and their partners are going to be able to deliver their solution in anything resembling a reasonable time frame, which again might give ULA an opportunity to cut in on the deal and establish their own infrastructure before anybody else can. Let's put it this way, the competition is on, and I think that we are well on our way to establishing this massive lunar economy that will not only provide the necessary supplies to feed our hungry civilization, but also establish solar power stations and other solutions that will revolutionize the future of our civilization. It's very exciting, and it's coming up, I think, in the next decade or two. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, also please hit those notification bells, and also please check the description for various ways to keep this content coming, and as always, stay angry about space!